Well, it's good to see you this morning at 11.57. I thought it was just going to be Tim and I, so it's really glad to see you here this morning. Uh, We're finishing up this morning the sermon series from December when we've been asking this question, what does it mean to call Jesus the Christ? That's what Christmas is, our belief that this baby born in a manger is the Christ. But what does that mean? What's the significance of that? And so we've been looking at each of the four gospel writers as they present the story of Jesus and asking them to help us understand what does it mean to call Jesus the Christ. So we've seen from the gospel of Mark that to call Jesus the Christ means that Christ had to suffer for our sins. In other words, to call Jesus the Christ is to believe that this is the one that God has sent to die on the cross for our sins because we needed a Savior. From the gospel of Matthew several weeks ago, looked at this idea that that to call Jesus the Christ is to believe that Jesus was the second person of the eternal triune God who became flesh and dwelt among us. It's quite a confession to make that that God became part of his creation. That's what it means to call Jesus the Christ. Last week we looked from the Gospel of Luke that to call Jesus the Christ means to believe that the kingdom of God has come and that Jesus is king and to live as if we're part of the kingdom of God now under the kingship of Jesus. And today, on the last Sunday of December, we get to look at the Gospel of John. And so if you want to join me in John chapter 20, there's four Gospel accounts in the Scriptures that tell the story of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all tell the story of Jesus in a pretty similar way. In fact, scholars have a name for them. They're called the synoptic Gospels. Synoptic means to see through the same point of view, the same vision. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke pretty much tell the story of Jesus in very much similar ways. John is the oddball. John tells the story of Jesus in a very different way. You notice in the Gospel of John, there's no Christmas story. There's no angel, Bethlehem, Magi, none of that in John. John has a theological Christmas story. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. It's the theology of John's Christmas story that helps us understand what happened in Bethlehem, but it's very different. John tells the gospel story arranged around seven signs, or we would use the word miracles. John uses the word signs. Seven signs, seven miraculous events, things that Jesus did, and he arranges his entire gospel around these seven signs. And the seven miracles that John focuses on is when Jesus turns the water into wine at the the wedding at Cana, the healing of the official son, the healing of the paralytic that was in the, the water of the pools of Bethsaida, the feeding of the 5,000, uh, walking on water, healing the man who was born blind, and then the last sign was raising Lazarus from the dead. So John, his whole gospel is arranged around these seven signs, and when it gets to the end here in chapter 20, he says to us why he has chosen to tell the story of Jesus by telling it through these particular signs. Now later on, the last chapter, John makes it very clear, these are not all the signs, the miracles that Jesus did. If all of them are written down, John says, probably all the books in the world couldn't contain them. But he's just saying, I've picked these seven for a purpose. And this is what John 20, beginning in verse 30, he tells us the purpose. He says, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written. I've chosen these seven for a purpose. These seven I I want you to know about for three reasons. Number one, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. John says, I've, I've told you these seven miracles because I want you to believe that Jesus is the Christos, the Mashiach, the, the promised one of the Old Testament. That's why I told you about these seven signs, number one. Second thing, he says, I want you to know what it means to call Jesus the Christ, that he is the Son of God. And that's how John is unique in this. And then the third thing is, I want you not only to know that Jesus is the Christ and what it means to call him the Christ, but also that by believing in him, you may have life in his name. So let's look at those three things this morning. Number one, he says he wants us to believe that Jesus is the Christ. So this is the reason John writes this gospel. He writes it primarily to a Jewish audience, and he wants to prove to them, look, Jesus is the Christ. We've been talking about this all month long. But of course, you know 
the vast majority of Jews did not and do not receive Jesus as the Christ. They do not believe Jesus is the promised Messiah. Uh, today, I've seen different numbers, but the estimates I've seen out of 14 million Jews on the planet today, that maybe 350,000 of them are Messianic Jews that believe Jesus is the Christ. That's about 3%. So a, still a very small portion of Jewish people today Believe what John says, this is what I want you to believe. I want you to believe that Jesus is the Christos. And yet a very small portion believe that. And then he says, what does it, what does it mean to call Jesus the Christos? Well, that Jesus is the Son of God. So this is why John begins his gospel the way he does. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. And then the Word became flesh. And in that chapter, first chapter, John talks about how we have seen His glory and His glory is of the, on, the only Son from the Father. And then he makes the statement, no one has ever seen God, but the only God who is at the Father's side, talking about the Son, that ha He has come and made God the Father known. So John chapter 1 is, is describing Jesus as the Son of God in these very incredible ways. He, he is God. He's at the Father's side. He has become flesh to make Him known. And John says to believe that Jesus is the Christos is to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, I know I'm, I'm scanning the room. The, the Sunday after Christmas is always the Sunday when the faithful show up. It's just that Sunday, a lot of people traveling, all that kind of stuff. I know we got the faithful online. But I'm looking across the room, and I know most of you believe Jesus is the Son of God. But can I just remind you for a second how, how radical that confession is? 30% of the world are Hindus. Hindus believe in one kind of immense unifying force is an impersonal force that cannot be known that is personified in hundreds, probably millions of different gods, but there's no real way to know the actual unifying force behind all of that. And in that system, Jesus could be one of the millions of gods, but they would certainly not believe that Jesus is the one true God and that there's only one God, nor would they believe that Jesus is the Christos who came to die for their sin because in Hinduism there is no concept of sin. It's just karma and reincarnation. There's no concept of needing for forgiveness of sin. So off the top, a third of the world rejects that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Then you take followers of Islam, about another third of the world. They certainly do not believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Matter of fact, in the Quran, it says he's not the Son of God. He did, he did not rise from the dead, and he did not die for their sins. In fact, in the idea of Islam, you know that in the Quran, it never says that God loves you or that you are to love God. It's all about obedience. And here, John is talking about a Jesus who has come to make the Father known so that we can know the Father's love for us, for God so loved the world that he sent his Son. Right? So it's a completely different understanding of not only God, but a rejection of what it means to call Jesus the Christos. So now you've got about two-thirds of the world who say, no, we don't believe that. Add to that the number of those in the world who are self-proclaimed atheists. Estimates in the U.S. I've seen between 5 and 10 percent U.S. population, seen different numbers, much higher in Europe and other places around the world, which leaves us about, what, 30 percent of folks who claim the name of Christ. But we know a vast majority of those are in name only. 65% of Americans claim to be Christians. They do polls that they call people on the phone and say, have you been to church this week? And 45% of Americans say yes. They are lying. If you do the other kind of poll where you call churches in a city and say how many people were on campus Sunday... And they call all the churches in the city and they compare it to populations. The number is closer to about 17% of church attendance in the U.S. Uh, but we know that there are plenty of people in our culture that bear the name of Jesus, say they, they are Christians, but they do not follow Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I was listening uh, to Christmas music this past week. And I was on a Spotify playlist, new holiday music or something. I was driving around. So I really wasn't paying much attention and then all of a sudden, I don't even know what the song was, but there was a lyric in a Christmas song that said, and I quote, 
I don't believe that Jesus died for our sins. That's too much pressure to put on a baby in a Christmas carol. So here we are, we're singing about Christmas, the very essence of Christ must, and rejecting the absent actual meaning of Christmas, that this baby is God in flesh who died for our sins. So you see what I mean? That we have a lot of people who will bear the name of Jesus, but they're not really followers of Christ. If you put that all in a percentage bucket and kind of stir it around, I would say estimates are probably 10 to 15 percent of people on this planet really believe that Jesus is the Christ and the Son of God and follow Him as Lord and Savior, which means that you are in the vast minority of people on the planet that believe what John was writing. The vast majority of people on the planet hear John say, I've written this that you may believe, and they go, nah. Why do you believe? Why do you believe? It's a good question. I'll give you three reasons of why I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe Jesus is the Son of God, number one, because of the resurrection. I think the resurrection is an undeniable historical fact. We have eyewitness testimony of people who saw Jesus being put to death very publicly. He didn't die in some emergency room somewhere when no one actually saw. He was put to death very publicly with very large crowds. And we have eyewitness testimony of people who saw Jesus alive after his death, not just individually in some upper room, but in large group appearances, to the point where Peter could stand in the city where Jesus was put to death 40 days later and say to a crowd, we are all witnesses that he is alive. And that's why 3,000 of them believe, because they're looking at each other going, yeah, I saw him too. We have eyewitness testimony. We have an empty tomb. You know, the Jewish religious leaders and the Roman civil authority, both of those were highly invested in stopping this Christianity thing. And all they had to do to stop it was to bring a dead body. If they just brought a dead body, it would have been at the end of Christianity and we could have all gone on with our life. But there was no dead body to bring because Jesus was alive. Another reason I believe in the resurrection is because of the changed lives of the disciples. These weak, timid fishermen that when Jesus was arrested, they scattered to the ends of the earth. After the resurrection, suddenly were willing to lay down their life for their belief that Jesus was alive. Now, there may be a one or two crazy people will, that will believe, that will be willing to be killed for a delusion like that. But when you start numbering up the martyrs in the tens and the hundreds, it is evidence of the resurrection. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God because of the miracles John tells us about these miracles, and if you look at them, all of these miracles that John records were not, you know, just card tricks that Jesus did in the upper room that just a few of the disciples saw. These were miracles that were done very publicly and demonstrated his power over nature and disease. I mean, the changing the water into wine at the wedding, it's a very public miracle, changing the chemical composition of water into something else. The feeding of the 5,000, obviously that's a, an enormous crowd. That was just the men that were there. So probably it was, what, 10, 15,000 people were there who witnessed that miracle. Raising Lazarus from the dead and Lazarus now walking alive among everyone after being dead for four days. I mean, he does these miracles very publicly to demonstrate his power over nature, his power over disease. He speaks and the wind and the waves obey him. I mean, these kind of miracles and signs demonstrate. And John's saying, if, if you would just understand them, you would understand that only the Son of God could do these things. That's what John is saying. But also, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And I think this is one of the most powerful evidences myself, which is the work of the Holy Spirit. Not only the past work of the Holy Spirit, but the present work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, next Sunday, we're going to start, a, well, I'm going to start, hopefully y'all will join me, a three-month study of the Thessalonian letters, First and Second Thessalonians. Uh, we'll start that next Sunday. Paul goes into the city of Thessalonica, this major Roman city that's got all the uh, temples to all the Greek and Roman gods all throughout the city, preaches the gospel. This is a city that's hundreds of miles away from Jerusalem where all this resurrection stuff happened preaches the gospel, and many believe, and Paul says, you turned from idols to the one true God. Now, how in the world does that happen? Because Paul was such a great communicator, uh, because 
there was money to be made in becoming a Christian? No. It was the work of the Holy Spirit, convicting people that they are sinners who need a Savior, opening their eyes to see the light of the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ, calling them to saving faith. And even today, you and I can bear testimony to the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, the continued work of the Holy Spirit. What's the old hymn say? You ask me how I know he lives. You know the next line? Because he lives within my heart. How do I know that Jesus is the Son of God? Because he is alive within me. So we believe this thing that John writes to us, and even though we are in the vast minority of the world's population that does, but we believe it for good reasons. But I hope that you see that what John says, John is not just saying, I want you to believe in Jesus so that you can check some box on a, uh, on a survey when someone calls you. Or you can put yourself into some group. He says, I want you to believe that Jesus is the Christos. I want you to believe what it means to call Jesus the Christ. You're saying he is the Son of God. And I want you, by believing, that you would have life in his name. Uh, it's interesting, when you read the Gospel of John, John uh, Jesus, in the Gospel of John, is constantly talking about how he is the one who can give life. So he's at the woman at the well. And she thinks she's there to get water. And Jesus says, you know, if you knew who I was, you'd ask me, and I would give you what? Living water. I have life to give to you. He does that over and over in the gospel. Probably the most famous part in the gospel is after he feeds the 5,000. He feeds 5,000, and then he tries to slip away, and they hunt him down. And so when they find him, he, he gives this sermon, and he, he spends the whole time talking about how I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. If you want to have life, come and, and consume me as the bread of life. And at the end of that sermon, that's why the, the people get frustrated with him. and says, do you want us to eat your body? What are you, what are you talking about? They don't understand what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I have life to give to you. And this is what John is saying. I want you to believe that Jesus is the Christos. I want you to believe what that means. He's the Son of God. But more than that, I want you to have life in his name. He wants you to have Life. Notice he says he wants us to have life by believing. I, I wish we used faith as a verb in the English language. It, it would be more accurate, I think. This is the word faithing. Because, for, you know, believing, believing, you know, we, we kind of mentally accept stuff to be true that we don't care about all the time. I mean, I believe in lacrosse. I just don't care at all. And it has nothing to do with my life at all, nor do I want it to at all. So, I mean, we can believe in stuff all the time that has nothing to do with us at all. But faith is something different. Faith is more than just believing something to be true. Faith is taking this Jesus and integrating Jesus into the entirety of our life because we believe that what John is saying, that if we do that, we have life. What's probably one of the best known verses in the Gospel of John? John 10, 10, the thief comes to steal, comes to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that you might have what? Life. And what kind of life? Abundant life. This is an interesting Sunday, the Sunday after Christmas. I, I've been preaching on the Sunday after Christmas for, you know, 20 some odd years now. And it's just always an interesting Sunday because the Christmas decorations are starting to come down. It feels kind of odd that Christmas decorations are still up because that was like so long ago. You know, I mean, like we've, we've moved on. Uh, and it's real easy. It's like the whole world around us is boxing up Christmas as if we're kind of done with the Jesus thing. And now what's the next holiday? I think it's Valentine's. I don't know what, or I know New Year's, I guess. You know, so we're moving on to the next season and we're just kind of boxing this up. And yet followers of Christ are very much aware this is not something that gets boxed up in fact instead of boxing it up and putting it in the attic this is something that begins to integrate into the totality of our life where we find life and we find it abundantly and this really is the power of as we share the gospel with the world who needs to hear the gospel is not just to hear the fact that Jesus is the Christos but to hear the fact that through faith you can have life in his name 
So what does that mean to have abundant life in Christ? If we had had the opportunity, I'd like to walk around with a microphone, and we could probably even do it today. Uh, Walk around with a microphone and ask, what does that mean to you? What does that mean to you? But let me just peg four words. What does it mean to have abundant life in Christ? Love, peace, joy, and hope. Love, peace, joy, and hope. Abundant life in Christ, Paul wrote in the book of Ephesians, is to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. It is to experience God's love for you in a very real, meaningful, significant way that goes beyond just mentally understanding God loves me. It is to to feel God loves me. Love, peace. Paul writes in the book of Philippians that if you are anxious about anything, you should pray about it. And when you turn it over to God, what is the result? We have peace that passes understanding. Because your mind's saying you shouldn't have peace. Your mind's saying, I got 15 reasons to be anxious here. But because of Christ in you, we now have peace. It is well with my soul. Love, joy, excuse me, love, peace, joy. What's the difference between joy and happiness? Happiness is conditioned upon circumstances. Joy is a God-given happiness that is not connected to circumstances. Your circumstances can go up and down, and yet your joy can be constant. Love, peace, joy, and hope. Hope is confident expectation of something that you know to be true, but you cannot see. Hope is confident expectation that tomorrow is going to be good because God is in tomorrow, and God has a plan for tomorrow, and God causes all things to work together for good, and so I hope. Love, peace, joy, and hope. So I was thinking about this, trying to define and describe abundant life. And so I I was thinking, you know, we talk about abundant life sometimes in ways about that it's something that we we have found. And then we talk about abundant life, I think, also in ways that we are finding, if that makes sense. And I think it's important that we talk about abundant life in both of those sense. Because sometimes if, if we talk about abundant life with unbelievers and we, we give the impression that, hey, once you have Christ, you have abundant life and all of your problems disappear and there's never any more difficulty ever again. Whereas we need to be able to proclaim the life in Christ is there are things that we have found that give us life in Christ and there are things that we're still finding because Satan never just, turns us away and say, oh, well, I lost that battle. I'm going to stop attacking him. He keeps coming back at us. So I think in my life, ways that I have found abundant life in Christ, I know I've, I've told this many times just because it's, it's the big part of my testimony. I was such a, a shy child growing up, such an introvert. I mean, I needed to grow about 100 points on the extrovert scale just to register on the scale as an introvert. I mean, that's how far down the scale that I was. And also was very insecure, which is not a great recipe for friendships. Uh, So as a result of that, I did not have friends. As a result of that, I was very struggled with loneliness, particularly in, in high school, but in early college. I mean, we have some of our college students here today. My, the biggest way that I found life in Christ for me was discovering that I could be alone and not be lonely. Discovering the reality of having a friend in Christ. I mean, we sing these hymns all the time, what a friend we have in Jesus, all that kind of stuff. But that's real. That you can have a friend. There is a friend who is closer than a brother. There is this relationship that you have in Christ. And I, I look back, that's such a transformational part of my life. Also, the, the insecurity thing was big as well. This discovering that I have value because God said to me, what you are worth to me is the cross. And when I finally got that and realized there's nothing that anybody else can add to my, that equation to make me more valuable, what are you going to add to the cross? 
I mean, the cross is good, but, oh, but she likes me. You know, there's, there's nothing really to add. Once you get that is where you start having security in life. And so I look back in my testimony, and I can share that in, in the past. And you, you, you have your stories that you can look back and say, I have found abundant life in Christ like this. But how are you finding abundant life in Christ? And this is a, this is a great year to be talking about that, isn't it? I mean, everything, everything that I have trained for and been educated and spent all my life doing as a pastor and a leader of a church, 95% of that was yanked out from under us in the middle of this year. I mean, the primary thing we do as a church is we bring people together. And suddenly we couldn't bring people together. It's like, well, what, what do we, what, 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 you know, that was kind of the, the way all my prayer started for about three months. You know, what, 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 you know. What do we do here? What, what is my role? What is, and, and finding peace that even though I didn't know this year was going to happen, God knew this year was going to happen. And even though I don't know what's going to happen as a result of this year, God causes all things to work together for good. God works everything out in accordance with the purpose of his will. And finding rest and finding peace in that. I remember this summer when I came to the peace with, with the truth, I don't have to understand this virus. I don't need to understand whether masks work or don't work. Just what does it look like to follow Jesus in the world in which we've been given? And let's go. And just the, let God figure out this stuff. And I don't know what 2021 holds and what it holds for me and what my role in that is, but I am confident that I can find life in the name of Jesus. That's where the hope is. At the end of that sermon in John chapter 6, when Jesus feeds the 5,000, then gives this whole bread of life sermon, and the people grumble and say, what do you want us to eat your body? And they, they follow away. And, and it says at the end of that, that many people were fo- uh, stopped following Jesus because the words he was saying were too tough to hear. And they kind of all trickle away, and Jesus turns and looks at the 12 and says to the 12, do you want to go to? And Peter speaks up, and finally says something smart. He looks at Jesus and he says, where else shall we go? You alone have words of life. Where else are we going to find life? You are the giver of life. So as we, you know, close this series and we close this year and we turn to the new year, I certainly echo the sentiment of John. I hope that you believe that Jesus is the Christos. And I hope that you understand what it means to call Jesus the Christ. That he's God who became flesh. He became flesh to be your savior, to die on the cross for your sins. He is the king of kings. The kingdom of God has come and he is reigning. And he is the son of God. But I also hope that you will embrace the invitation. It's not just so that you can believe that, but it's so that you can find life in his name. And I know some of that life you can look back on and say, I have found. And some of that life you're looking in the future saying, I am finding. Keep seeking. He is the giver of life and abundant life. Let's pray together.